Yes. It says it's streaming live on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. there we go. Yeah. Hey guys, so we're here. We are here with Lisa Paul. Give me just one second to get everything just right. Okay, we're here with Lisa Paul with the Death Deck. Welcome, Lisa. Hi, Dana. I'm glad to be here. So what I, Lisa, let me just really quickly tell you about Lisa. So she and her friend, she'll tell you about her, created this death deck. I don't know if you, I want to be able to see it. The death deck. It's a card thing. Lisa's a, a clinical licensed social worker and she works with uh, people at end of life and, and through emergency medicine too. And I want her to tell us a little bit about what she does on the outside before we get into the death deck. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about your life. You sound like you have, wow, you're an emergency, you're an end of life. What do you do? Yeah, so I've worked as a, um, as a social worker. I got my master's degree in 1999. Um, and since then, I've, um, I spent a little time working in mental health, and then I moved over to end of life. So I've been in the end of life space for about 15 years. Um, working in, in primarily in hospice and also about eight years in emergency medicine. So, um, in the in hospice, I provide you know supportive counseling and resources and kind of walk with patients and families during this final phase of their life. Um, in the emergency room. I have a very different role. I am kind of the person they call when they don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I help find out who a John Doe is. Um, I, I um, provide assessments for people who might be um, suicidal, um, resources for our homeless population, as well as chemical dependency. So it, it's, it's um, you never know what's going to happen exactly. during an ER shift. Yeah. Um, the hospice is a little more, you know, um, the ER is fast paced. I need to think critically. I need to problem solve. Right. Hospice is slow down. Right. Fit. Be present. So very, very different um, feeling. It's a different way of, of being uh, healing, the healing presence is different. Very different. Very yeah. different. And it doesn't discount the other and one's not right and the other wrong. It's a different time of life, uh, a different time of being in those moments <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that is appropriate for those moments. Yes. And what I see in the ER, you know, end of life related is, is a lot of the sudden death or you know, um, emergency or medical crisis, you know, heart attack, a stroke, um, and, and family members kind of in that initial shock moment. Um, and again, versus hospice where many times, not all the time, but right. many times people have had some time to kind of um, process and some come to terms with um, a diagnosis and prognosis. So, it's, it's kind of that first moment versus later moments down the road. What I want to explore just a little bit before we keep going is I love it that you have both sides because there's a lot of talk of, you know, um, exploring, you know, how to talk to people during dying and death and what's helpful and things. And um, to me, there's some discounting if, of the way people do things in the acute care setting that it's not appropriate at hospice time, which is true. There's a lot about that that is true. However, what I what, with you being here, seeing both so um, completely, you're immersed in both. Um, I guess I wanna bring a reality check to everyone, especially people new in the end of life industry. There's a lot of people excited about end of life. They're in other uh, roles in other areas. And sometimes there's a romanticism about the way we do things in hospice and that um, there's a generalization that we should do it all the same or that they need to be doing, they being acute care need to do it the way we do it and, and all of that. But you pointed out something. There's a lot of um, quick death or traumatic death, accidental death, whatever's happening. It's not, one day I'm walking here with you. The next day my you're dead. And I'm, people are really, it's a whole different 
thing as you would expect, but there's also people coming into ER who have, um, they've been having a journey with a very serious illness and it's still that trauma yeah. um, when they die. And it's appropriate, I feel in a lot of ways, the way you are handling things. And of course there's a place for things to get better. So can you give us some insight about that, about um, the appropriateness of what you're doing and maybe some things where you see it could possibly be improved just like anything else? Yes, I mean, you the very, very good points um, because I, um, so I came to emergency medicine because I needed a break from hospice. I had had um, several miscarriages after the birth of my son. And, um, and I was just surrounded in my own grief and loss and said, I, I've, I've got to do something different for a bit. And that's how I came to emergency medicine. And I was fortunate enough to, to um, get employed by the hospital very close to my home. And um, so, I, I kind of came in with this hospice heart <laughs> and, you know, trying to approach emergency medicine in a similar way. And I quickly realized that that, um, while there's great skills that I can bring, um, such as listening um, more than maybe somebody that hadn't had that background. <laughs> right. Um, and, uh, and my knowledge and comfort with death was helpful. Uh, but in terms let me pause right here and say, these are doula skills right here. What you just said is a beautiful explanation of the way a doula operates. Okay, go on, continue. Thank you. So I, I would, I learned quickly that um, people who are faced with a sudden crisis, a medical crisis, um, and let's just use the example of you and I are talking and then a few minutes later, you have a massive stroke. And and um, I call 911, you're rushed to the hospital. I'm, I'm trying to make sense of things. I arrive in the ER um, and, and I'm, I am just in shock. And so, um, you know, I, I, I cannot as, as the hospice social or the ER social worker, um, I, I need to recognize the shock and how little you can absorb in that moment. Um, and, but I'm using a lot of the same skills. I'm sitting with that person as they're trying to get information on what's happening. Um, I'm, I'm noting their physical, what can I do physically for them? Can I bring them a glass of water? Can I find a chair? What can I do in that moment to, um, let this person know that we're here, that I'm, I'm supporting them. Um, sometimes we'll offer to call a chaplain uh, in those moments, especially if, if we're not sure on the outcome for the family member, uh, offer to call another family member to come. So I'm doing very um, immediate crisis uh, tending right. in that time. Um, which again, some of those skills are used in hospice, but but not. Um, but it's slow in hospice, right? There's people have had time. This isn't their first conversation. In in the situation right. where someone's had a stroke, you know, you your your mind cannot catch up to the events that are happening, and so people you know describe it as being in a dream or in a daze, and um, and 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 that is what makes decision-making incredibly different at that moment in time is that, you know, trying to help someone know what decisions their loved one might want them to make. Yeah. <laughs> that's a whole other, and that's kind of where the death deck comes from is. is yeah. Is well, let's that. go before we get to the death deck. I want to go. Now you said that part. Now, what about the person who's seriously ill? Um, let's just choose cancer because that's a little more uh, emergent than someone with end stage heart disease or lung disease. But let's say someone has uh, wants to live. They're struggling with their illness to live. And with cancer treatment, you can be near death, but you come out of it, you can heal and all that. But there are points along the way where you can be near death. 
and be coming into the hospital. And of course, when someone has the mindset that they are going to do everything to live. So now that person comes into ER. Now, how, how's that different than hospice versus a uh, stroke? Cause like you said, with the serious illness, they have some understanding already. They're dealing with something very serious. That, you know, Deanna, I think that that's the hardest. Yeah. That's the hardest because, um, well, maybe not the hardest. That's hard to, it's all hard. I hear you. I hear it's you. all yeah. hard. But in terms of what I can do in that situation, that's where I feel the most uncertain because it really depends on, um, you know, that person's story what they're able to hear, what they want to hear, how protective the family is, who's by their side, the ER physician and the um, admitting physician and how they're talking to the patient and family about what's going to happen. Um, so, you know, I have a reputation as being the hospice social worker that works in the ER. So the physicians know that I am willing to kind of approach conversations about palliative care that they may not have time or quite honestly desire <laughs> to have. Or expertise. In or expertise. Yeah. I mean, they're ER, right? They're, exactly. they're fixing the crisis. They're just, that's, and, and right. they're remarkable. These are right. remarkable people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so it's, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of testing the waters and getting a sense of where the patient and family are at. Um, I will often email my colleagues who can then follow up um, because it may not be in that moment that the, right. that's best to discuss right. palliative care yeah. or um, next steps. But we have a great team. So the communication is, you know, this is a situation I think would really benefit from palliative care. Can you check in on them in the next day or so as they're in the ICU or right. another floor? So, um, but I have had situations where, where we've actually been able to bring in hospice straight from the ER yes, yes. and get people home because yes. they come in and they say, I don't even want to be here. Right. I just want to go home. I want to see my kids. Yes. And of course, now with COVID, visitation policies are different. Right. Um, more people want to be home because of those right. constraints of the hospital that are even more so right now. Right. So there are opportunities, but it is a very delicate balance. I'm so, I'm, that, thank that. you for explaining that. I think it'll benefit a lot of people to hear uh, the complexities and the layers of what goes on. I know that we get it on a, on a level that acute care is like this and hospice is like this, but sometimes comes some uh, not understanding fully that what's going on in the background. And so I really appreciate you sharing that. Okay, well, let's go to the death deck and then let's just see what comes up um, from here on out. I want people to know, I want to show you, I'm going to put everything back in the thing. Um, here we go. The death deck. It's about this big. And I just think it's adorable. Um, <laughs> I just love it. So I want to get into Thank it. You. Tell me, tell us what inspired this. Now tell us who your partner is and, and what inspired this. Yes. And I love that you think we call him Scully, but I love that you think Scully is cute because we, we really were looking for trying to find an approachable um, image as well as um, something that let people know what they were getting themselves into. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're not trying to be sneaky about it. We're right. letting So let me show them this. So this is a little instruction packet that you get in with Scully. And I'm just, let me just show. So, you know, it's, she, they don't leave you in the lurch to figure it out. So, okay, go ahead. So um, this game came out of my relationship with my friend, Lori. Now, Lori, I met when I was the hospice social worker for her husband, Joe. 
Um, he had pancreatic cancer at 44 oh. and um, died about a year later. And um, because he was so young with young kids, they did what many people do, which was um, focus on next steps, um, treatment, surviving. Um, and so he was on hospice for just over a couple weeks. Oh. Um, and then I provided support to Lori, um, bereavement support after the fact. And we kind of joke around because I, I really liked her. So I spent probably more time with her <laughs> because we, we had a connection. Yeah. yeah. Um, we then separated for, you know, I said, okay, our bereavement's done. And she reached out a few years later um, and, and said, hey, I'm, I'm working on a book. And so we reconnected and through that friendship came up with, you know, how can we, what can we do on a macro level to help people be more prepared than what I see every day and what Lori experienced for herself. And um, we kind of looked at what was out there in terms of conversation games, and there's some great ones. Um, but we were looking for what can we bring to the table um, that's different. And so we added a little humor and added some multiple choice questions so that it took a little of the pressure off when you're trying to decide how to answer. Um, we also, with the multiple choice, you can partner up and guess each other's answers. So that way it turns into more of a game that you can actually keep score on. So, you know, one couple could play against another couple and you could, you know, you say, who knows each other's each other better. Um, and the whole purpose is to get conversations started, especially among people who wouldn't be having these conversations. So, um, we have been fortunate enough that death doulas have really responded well. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> there we have. Yeah. Okay. Look at this guys. Um, so what you need, hold on. I love the way it says the death deck, a sense of humor and a willingness to go into uncharted territory. And for us, competitive types we can even score i want to take, i want to play that one i love that so i can see how this could be super fun so i want us to go through each thing we can do it on zoom right i want us to go through the party play and i want us to go through the partner play and uh so is there any more you want to say before we take on one of these things um no i don't think so let's just get into it okay so now <clears throat> I'm just going to show, look at all these cards. Oh my God. This is a card, card person's <laughs> dream, your dream deck right here. Okay. So what do we, so what, explain the first, we're going to do partner play first. So explain about that. Okay. So partner play works when, when you're in a setting, um, like a game night with friends or family and, and you can do this over zoom. We've had lots of people do it over zoom. Um, and so this is, when you partner up with someone you know well, um, and then, like I said, you guess each other's answers. Oh, you guess each other's answers. Yeah. Okay, so let's be intuitive here. Okay. We don't know each other well. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Okay, we don't know each other well, but say we, are, we found each other somehow, we're gonna chitty chat, and I just found this death deck, and so let's do it. Maybe you're another death doula and I just met you and we're playing with the deck. Okay, so what do we do now? How do we do the score? Okay, so the way to do it is um, we have a download where you can, um, on our website that you can do a scoring card, but you can just make your own on your little piece of paper. Okay, all right, I got one. What did I put on it? So you make two columns, I say and you say. So one side is I say, and one side is you say, okay. or me and you, however you want to say it. But basically, do you want um, control of the screen? Do you need me to give you, do you need the screen? Um, do you I can, oh, I think on your little instructions on the back, there's a scorecard that gives an example. Yeah, like this. Yes, I say, you say, there you go. Okay, got it, points, okay. 
So we're going to read a question. I'm going to write on the I say column my answer, and then I'm going to write down what you say, what I think you're going to say in the okay. you say column. Okay. And then we'll see if we get them right. Okay. So we get a point for each. So we could get two points if we both guess each other's answers, or we could get one, or we could get zero. Okay. So do I? So do you, you want to pick one, or I pick one? Uh, now, I got purple and yellow. Do I need to change them up? Do I need to put the purples in one and yellow in another? So the purple are the multiple choice ones that we can guess. The the yellow are open ended, so it's a little harder to guess people's answers. So we kind of we call that all play, where it's just a conversation. Okay, so let's do partner play first, and then we'll do all play. Okay. And this is the partner play, the and then we'll do the other one. Let me. I'm just. Let me get my cards separated here. Okay. I have some some questions. I I could start with one. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um. Here's one that we can try and guess each other's answers. Okay. At. You're approaching the end of life. Others are making your healthcare decisions. Should price factor in? Oh, Lord. A, <laughs> yes, don't blow through my savings to prolong the inevitable. B, in moderation, necessary expenses are fine. C, spare no expense, buying me every second. Okay, so you're going to guess me and, my, and I'm going to guess you? Yes. So should price factor in? Yes. In moderation or no are basically the the answers. This is a hard one to guess. I'm gonna I'm gonna admit. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna okay, I'm gonna guess something. Okay, okay, I got mine and I got your guess. I guessed about you. And y'all write down out there your answer too. Write down if you're with somebody um, or okay. just write down your own and why, your why. Okay, so what do we do now? Okay, well, my paper is a mess. So I'll just, I'll. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I should have made a clean paper. I'll do it for the next one. Okay. Um, so I answered, so, so we just reveal what we answered or okay. what we guessed and answered. Okay, so let's do you first. So I- I said, yes, that you would do everything because you're, to me, this is my values. I'm 60 years old. I feel like you're very young. Why not? Would you try every damn thing under the sun? Depending on what you had, because there's always a miracle sometimes, and we don't know when it's going to show up depending on what you have. But I said, everything. <laughs> Tell me what you said. <laughs> I, I said, be moderation. Okay. Yeah. So and I don't get a point for you. We don't get a point for that okay. one. We're a team. So we're in it together. So, okay. so far we have zero points. Okay. Um, yeah. My, my own, my reason for being more of the moderation is just from working in this space and seeing, seeing the, the whole picture. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I'm, I'm, a, I'm in the middle of that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually guess that you were be in yes. the middle in moderation. We got it. All right, woohoo! Woo so you get a point. <laughs> so we've got a point as a team. Now we'll just pretend that we're playing with another, you know, two other sets of death doulas. And um, I thought we were doing partner play. We are partner. Oh, so this isn't something you do with just one other person. It's something you do with like a group of two, another group of two. Well, Deanna, we can do it however we like. Okay. So, <laughs> the, partner the, play, <laughs> the partner play just means that we're, we're partnering up and guessing each other's answers. You okay. can play it one-on-one -on -one like this and, you know, we can have a great time. Um, I've done this with a few friends over Zoom and, and we, you know, had a great time. In, in, a, in like a game night setting, if you know, if you have groups of like two, then you can partner up and do this. Love that. The, the larger all play is kind of in, you know, we've done 
game nights and conferences and in groups where um, there's not an even number of people or they don't know each other well enough to feel comfortable guessing. And so it's more of a conversation in that setting where you're, you're asking a question and people are just answering. So that's, that's the other way. Well, what I like about this is, you know, we don't know each other and I just enjoyed, I learned something about you. You ver you validated something that I think too, those of us who work in the field have a little bit um, stronger opinions about things um, that might not be the norm, you know, whatever yeah. the norm is, but um, you know, I even have it down to, if I have this cancer, I'll do this, this cancer, I'll do it. Cause I've seen so many end stage, you know, types of cancer. And, and if I have heart disease, if I have this, this is what you, cause I've seen so many scenarios and I, I feel like you, you know, I feel like I have a, a really strong grip. Doesn't mean when I get there that I'll follow it. That's the other thing, right? Yes. I'm, I'm always, well, I try. I try to be careful and say, this is how I think I'll feel in that situation, but but I really don't know until I'm there. Right. This, this is how I feel currently. And I know that, you know, in my work as a hospice nurse for 15 years and as a private end of life doula for 15 years, so I've been doing this 20 years, they I had some overlap doing it at the same time. Um, I've seen so many situations and people going through situations and so many different types of decisions making for so many various, like there's just never one thing the same as another um, situation or reason. Right. And um, I've just heard not a lot. Uh, let me just guess around 25%. I don't know if that's the right number of people who say I'm surprised by how I'm handling this right now. Cause I thought I always thought I was going to do X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. Have you had any experience with that? Uh, people talking about that to you? Yeah, definitely. And I think, I think that has made me a little more cautious about giving any absolutes about what I would do. Because like you said, even that answer of the B moderation. Now I've been very clear with my family about how I believe and what I want in terms of, um, you know, how aggressive I would want them to be in certain situations. Exactly. However, <laughs> I also know that what may be going on in our lives may impact all of those decisions if that happens. And so there's so yeah. many things that play in, you know. It really um, does. It really does. There's a um, advanced directive worksheet that the Funeral Consumer Alliance of Central Texas has on their website. If anyone's interested, um, I'll try to remember to put that in the underneath thing. Um, and it has, it's a worksheet. If this, do you want that? Like in, it has uh, X and Y axis in it and it asks you to think about things. And in that, what that helped me do is for my own moderation kind of issues, or like if I had an accident, is brain capacity, yes. uh, physical, paraplegic, quadriplegic, brain damage. What, what do I want? And, and I put percentages um, based on the, the three physicians, two physicians, because they all confer when something like that goes on there. One a physician is not making that determination. Will you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think it's great that you have been as specific as you have been, because I think, you know, one of the things um, I work, I'm primarily in the ER, but I, I also cover people in the ICU and have spent quite a bit of time there in, in addition to the ER. And so um, what what's most distressing for families is not knowing what to do. That's my experience. That's my perception is when people know with confidence or at least some confidence that they're making the decision that that person would want, um, they're still sad, they're still struggling, they're still overwhelmed, but they're not um, consumed with what should we do. Right. Um, so when, when we have conversations and, and then importantly document those conversations, um, but the conversations are what give us that confidence. So I've had people come in and say, oh my gosh, you know, my dad told me never, ever, ever what he wanted to be in this situation. And he told me that, and they, they remember 
yeah. that conversation, they have emotions about it. It's, it, it is a strong connection to, and it's, it's visceral. I don't want to do this. Yeah. They know it with every they ounce know of it. Being. Yeah. They know it. And, and even though it may be very difficult and it may be the, on the other side too, yeah. you know, my dad said he wanted to live to be a hundred, no matter, no matter what. what, yeah, no matter what. So we're going to keep going. I've had people well, say, don't think I, should. Well, my, I blinks, I want to be here. I've had people tell me that. Yeah. And so that helps guide the family mm -hmm. um, because they, they know it's, it's all of the conversations that aren't being had <laughs> that create this chaos and indecisiveness, which creates anxiety and worry. And, and, and then, um, and then second guessing after the fact, you know, totally, totally. Um, should we have tried longer? Should we have put a trach in? Like, should we have done these things? I wish we had known what they wanted. Um, so and not only that, um, I've worked with people because I work hospice. Um, I worked a lot of hospice and nursing. You're always there. They can't choose whether they have you. They can choose. They don't want the social worker or the chaplain. And, and when mm -hmm. they do that, they're stuck with us and we're having to handle everything. <laughs> and so I have seen it. Um, often enough, another one of those things, maybe about 20% or so, or 10, maybe 10, 10 to 20 of this kind of person, which is mom has the advanced directive, everything spelled out. And they're still feeling guilty to implement. Are we really here? Is this really happening? Or maybe it's like there's, they have it all down. Even as far as I've seen it like this, mom has dementia, Mom can't speak. She can hardly eat. Um, we're, the hospice says we're near the end. Somebody's recommending in the nursing home to put a feeding tube. Mom says, don't keep me alive like this. And the adult children were so confused, even with her advanced directive. So it shows you, shows all of us, even with documentation, how it can be so hard on the loved ones left behind, even with documentation. Oh, definitely. It's always going to be hard. You know, with all the conversations in the world, it's still going to be hard. Um, this is a family member, you know, I, and in addition, I, I think people in my experience struggle the least when they not only have that document, but they've had conversations about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. That's one the point I'm making is if even when you have it, it can happen. So yes, please have it documented. And if you don't have it documented, like you said, that one woman who heard her father say and knew that that's what now. Um, so yes, having the conversation at least documented, please do try because you could end up leaving your loved ones a terrible legacy of guilt and, yeah. and hard, hard feelings, sad feelings, very conflicted. I know people still crying 10, 15 years later, not sure they did the right thing. So it's a suffering that every, any one of us does not want to give and leave a le legacy to our loved ones. And if we don't do this paperwork, that's what we could be leaving our loved ones. And none of us, ex I don't expect to get drop dead with a heart attack. I mean, not drop dead, but uh, have a stroke, a heart attack, an accident, um, a terminal illness that can be, leukemia can happen really fast within a week. Um, I don't anticipate that. So a lot of people feel that way. They don't anticipate that happening. So they're going to put off their advanced directive. But the truth is that we don't know what could happen to any one of us. So to have it complete, even if it's imperfect, mm -hmm. I just feel like people think, well, I'm not sure. And I haven't done all the, just create, do the best you can have it there, even though it's imperfect. And then also um, even uh, people don't want to feel the pain. I know I felt pain when I was doing my advanced directives. I cried through them because I don't want, I want to be here with the grandkids. I, mm -hmm. I don't, I want, I don't want my daughters making these decisions. I, and it makes you get in touch with your own sadness around it, you know? Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, I think that's one of the things, reasons people put it off and that we don't really talk about as much. I think, I think, you know, um, National Healthcare Decision Day is coming up on April 16th. And um, we've, 
um, we've partnered with Jen O'Brien, who um, wrote this great book, The Hospice Widows um, Journal. And so she, we're basically trying to get the message out about April 16th. Let's, let's do a push everybody in this space because this is an opportunity to encourage people to do their advanced directives and have these conversations. Um, but I do think one of the reasons we we don't do it is because it really is facing our own mortality, thinking about things that are hard. Um, and, and, you know, our day-to-day -day life gives us so many things to distract ourselves with. We just don't want to, it's hard. It's hard to say. It is hard. And I mean, even when I think, oh, I'll be dead. And, you know, for me, it's okay that I'm dead mm -hmm. for me. That's how, when I was doing mine, I'm like, I really want to see, I want to be with grandkids. I don't have yet. I want to, I really want, but if I die, okay, that's fine. But I was grieving so hard for my kids because we're close and I know they'll be devastated if I don't make it, if I'm not here for the wedding or the first grandkid or all of those things are that to have me as they live their life. Cause that's what we do together. We work out our boundaries. We have a lot of engagement. So it's not that we just, okay, she's feeling it that you blow it off you don't tend to, when you don't engage with all those boundaries, working things out with your loved ones, um, when you do that, I mean, you really will miss them. I miss, <laughs> you're engaging and building together and being vulnerable and, and getting clean and clear with your communication. And that hurts when they're not there, when you're doing that. Yeah. It's yeah. like, wow. And so I, I just couldn't visualize them um, I know how they're going to grieve, but also I've been teaching them along the way ab about how to carry on and how I'll be and, and things that will stay connected in, in my belief system. Mm -hmm. And so we can't talk about it too long because we'll start crying or somebody's like, okay, I can't take any more of that. But I mean, I feel like that's part of the conversation. It is. But you know, I, I really believe and Lori and I both believe this as, as part of, you know, well, two things. One, these playing the death deck or having these type of conversations makes you feel more connected. Yeah. Like you and I barely know each other. And I, I, I'm we're like in it now. I know. I want to play more. Let's do. I want to do. Okay. Some, okay. So, are we gonna do a purple? What did you just do? A purple card, or you did a purple card? Because I did a purple voice. card. Those okay, are our. Let me do it. Race. I'm, I'm gonna shuffle my deck, and I want to do you next. Okay. I'm gonna do the question. All right. What would be the? My intention is that we're gonna pick a card that's gonna be wonderfully informative and fun so we call it stacking the deck when okay. you want so um you know we have enough cards in here to play this a million i mean so sure. many times right yeah. um and the some of the cards are more appropriate for different settings so some okay. of the cards are lighter and yeah. great to play in a bar or a restaurant and uh -huh. just <laughs> talk to people about things like um you uh -huh. know whether people believe in spirits and that sort of thing um so and cool. then there's then there's questions that are more um helpful for advanced care planning right questions about like yeah. do your loved ones know where your advanced directive is you know yeah. so, so so stacking the deck just means like i'm going to be thoughtful about what questions i think would work best in this setting um, so if I'm going to bring it for a game night, I'm going to, okay, these are the cards we're going to use, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and especially wait, like with death doulas and people who are using it for community engagement, we really recommend people take a look at what you're going to ask before. Absolutely. You, I love you that. Know. You said that you pointed that out, stacking the deck. Y'all. So be mindful of the, of the audience that you're with right. um, in my mm -hmm. belief system too. What I teach is that. Anytime you're public doing anything in the public and anything to do with illness, even just illness, much less dying and death, um, grief is in the room. So you don't know who has been through what. It is old grief, whatever they're going through presently with grief is in the room. So we have to be tender and kind and conscientious people like us who 
our end of life leaders in our community, whether we think we are or not. If we're having a game night with this, you're an end of life leader, in my opinion, because you're leading a conversation or holding space for it. So it's important that we take responsibility for that and have some boundaries. Yes. Because we're not, most of us are not licensed therapists or chaplains or social workers to deal with what may come up in the room if you go too deep for the, for the uh, situation. Right. Even a light question could bring that up in somebody, but at least you didn't, uh, at least you took responsibility to be careful, right? And, and have the lighter cards. Exactly. To be, to be deliberate. Deliberate. Love that. So then when you're with your group, like say you have a women's group that you do or the neighbors and you are more comfortable with them, then it, then that is appropriate to say, Hey guys, it might get heavy. If it does just step out or just, we'll stop the game. <coughs> right. Cause you know, yeah. you're, yeah. Yeah. I think the more, you know, your group, the more you can um, better, you know, you can select the cards easier um, if you're doing a general population, I do think it's it's important to be deliberate and be thoughtful about how triggering the questions might be. Um, we do have people use some of the use our cards for um, the hospice chaplains who um, start the reflection for IDT for hospice. Oh, I love that. So trying to get the team to actually think about their own. Yes, the team would be great for this. Oh. Yeah, and and it's it's been really neat watching. Um, we've used it on my hospice team, and and um, like like many professionals, you know, I mean, I think they almost roll their eyes at me at this point because it's like, oh, Lisa, she's really like off the deep end in her death <laughs> in this death world, you know. Um, but they don't. We're working in hospice, and people still aren't thinking and talking about what they would want for themselves, even professionals. Oh, I know. Age. Yeah. Every conference I've ever been to, I don't know about you, but every end of life conference with an HPCO or Texas, New Mexico hospice or we do our little area. Anyway, anybody, they always say, how many of you raise your hand or said, no, they have you stand up and sit down. If you've done it half the room never has them done half the room. Yeah. It's incredible. It is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to pick one for us. I'm going to do the same question of, of, of three choice, and then we'll do one of the other ones. Okay. okay. All right, let me do this one. This is the one. Oh, this is good. The best death for me would take place. Y'all do it with us out here. The best death for me would take place, A, at home, B, in a hospital, C, while doing something I love. Wink, wink. <laughs> this is the question. The best death for me would take place. So what's your choice? All right, let me. Okay. And I'm going to say that people love to give D answers. Um, me. Oh, okay. Like, Make your okay. own, you yeah, know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, because, and, and that's great. We love the answers. Um, when we're trying to guess, then we, we kind of force people, well, what best fits your answer? Yeah, yeah. Um, but then everybody wants to explain, right? You're like, yeah. well, I'm going to say that's this. the conversation. That's part. the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you go ahead first this time. Okay. I think. So I'm going to say that you guessed A. Yes, I did. Goes without saying. I don't want to drop dead. I want people to have time, my kids especially. Yeah. And yeah. I think you did at home too. I did. <laughs> I did. And and I think, you know, there's been a recent, a couple of recent articles on how many people want to die at home and how how that number is so much larger than how many people actually die at home. Um, it is. And I, I know there's challenges of being at home, um, you know, in terms of caregiving and all of these, yeah. these aspects. But um, I had the privilege last summer of helping take care of my mother-in-law who was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer at the end of May. And she died um, in, in mid August. So we had 
you know, three months, the stereotypical three months pancreatic cancer is almost to the day how it occurred. Um, and, oh, I was just so grateful that she, um, she actually immediately chose hospice or pretty immediately within a couple of weeks. And we were home that, that time. Um, wow. And it gave us so much yeah. precious time and, and time together as a family. And there were a lot of things working in our favor that allowed that to happen. Yeah. That, yeah. You know, not everyone can, um, right. but it just, it reinforced to me that that is what I want for myself. Yes. Yeah, beautiful. And, you know, I know people too, that would rather die in the hospital. Some people, especially people like that have end stage lung disease, like COPD or end stage heart disease, they actually feel a comfort uh, to be, they plan to be in the hospital. You know, I find that's true. And I, I want them to die wherever they want. Uh, yeah. I, I agree. And I think you know, there's, there's also the in-between. Um, we're fortunate enough in our area to have a, a boarding care that specializes in end-of-life hospice patients. And I know some places have, you know, hospice homes where yeah. people can be in that's, that's kind of in-between. Yeah. So you have that support and maybe in your, it's, it's less um, caregiving for your family. Yeah. Um, so you all look that up. It's Omega House. Look up Omega Houses, social model hospice house and see if you have that. It's not under the Medicare, under the hospice Medicare benefit. Um, the hospice houses that are under a particular um, hospice is under the Medicare benefit. And it, and it has very strict guidelines of who can come in when. That's the hospice house that most people are used to. The one she and I are talking about is the one where it's community supported. It's usually nonprofit and up to three months. That's the model that most of the Omega houses are using. One month, two month and three month uh, projection of life. And then they act as the, the caregiver and that way the family can be with you and the hospices come in and handle the medical. So it's beautiful. Isn't it, Lisa? Oh, it's beautiful. I have a friend that's currently at our hospice house here. And it's just been, I mean, they bake cookies, they and and the caregivers are are specifically trained in end of life. And, and they're taking care so the family can relax as much as they can and yeah. love just be there loving their loved one. Yeah, and I think, you know, especially if some some families and some cultures and some families with kids don't want a death to occur at the house too. The house, yeah. That's another factor is if, if people are uncomfortable or that feels um, scary to them, then um, that's another good, good option out there, depending on your area. Right. I'm writing down some of the things that we've said so I can put it in the notes. I have a mega house death deck. I don't forget what else. I forgot what else I said we should put in there but we'll, we'll figure it out so this yellow group this is um the yellow part are, are the open-ended yes and you could try to guess someone's answer there but i think it's a lot harder <laughs> so let's just pick one i'll just pick one and this would be like if you're at the party or like a more intimate party or this could be at the public event too depending on maybe the question the yes answer. yes it could be at a at a a public event. Um, okay, let's do this one. Secret ink. I don't. I haven't read it yet, but it looks fascinating. At the moment of death, a secret tattoo appears on your body that symbolizes something you stood for or believed in. What is it, and where is it? Oh, I love that. At the moment of death, a secret tattoo appears on your body that symbolizes something you stood for or believed in. What is it and where is it? I love that. Mm, good. I'm glad you love it. <laughs> I, I find, I have to tell you, I find this question hard to answer because it, it keeps changing for me, which, which yeah. okay. that's okay, Lisa, right? <laughs> totally. And that just also shows why some people, the tattoos have a million of them because there's so many important things, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I love this. Yeah. I, I Do think, you have one? well, you know, 
Well, I have I have an actual tattoo that is of a hummingbird. Um, and, and I got it right after my great grandma died, which was my first important death in my life. I had just turned 18. So also I wanted a tattoo, <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> but I wanted it to be something meaningful. And I would sit on my grandma's lap and, and stare out the window at a bird feeder and that I was very close with her. And so that became like my connection to my grandma. Um, and so I've, I, I've since kind of, you know, wanted tattoos, but I wanted to have that sense of meaning for me. And, and so I haven't yet gotten another tattoo because, um, because I've been um, indecisive about what that would be. But in this example, you know, I, I, it, it would be something related to what I now believe is my like life work and passion, which is these conversations. You know, I, that is what has become really meaningful to me is, is how, um, is, is encouraging these conversations, connecting with people. Um, so I don't know if I want the cute Scully on me. Uh-huh, something a little uh-huh. more, um, uh, I could see that beautiful with that image, um, but something that that's now what I find incredibly meaningful is is this work. Yeah, I've thought about five things as we as when I first <laughs> saw it. Yeah, I could totally relate to you about it. I could see it changing depending on when I you asked me the question. Yeah. And I think that's super cool too, because I'm sure this card helps people pop with what's most important to them, which I think we need to be mindful of. Mm -hmm. So we can base our decisions in our life on that instead of what people expect of us or whatever. With this finite time that we have on this planet, our death marks the power and meaning of all the moments leading up to it. There's a finite time we have here which brings more meaning on the way we spend our time now. And this card seems to help clarify, what am I going to do? There's a, there's an exercise somebody I got from somebody else. um, And it goes something like this. Look at your calendar and the last three months, look at your calendar and your checkbook. And that'll tell you where your priorities are. And if you agree, keep it. If you don't change it like immediately. So for me, Um, I have like my back now is my new um, memorial grounds. I think (laughs) I, I didn't mean for that to happen, but I started with this beautiful thing and then it's all angled the way I want it in my back. And then my mom died. So she's, uh, and then I have this transformation um, symbol thing coming out of the middle and then my mom died. So she's now perched on one of the little things with their little beautiful unique butterfly and um very simple though and then the next person that dies I already know where they're going so (laughs) I feel like it's going to be memorial gardens back there but for this for this I feel it on my heart because love I'm so grateful that love has been the number one thing that draws me to everything that I do um, for healing. So there was somebody I saw their tattoo that was just striking. And I don't remember exactly now, it was years ago, but it represented um, your heart and being broken and mangled and woven, healed, healed. You could see it was, it was representative of that living this life fully will break your heart mm-hmm. and inevitable. And also our choice to keep loving heals our choice, our action, not just time. So I I was just mesmerized with that. And I feel like that's what I want because I, my heart has been completely shattered and broken at various times, like all of us, it's not unique to me (laughs) (laughs) and our chosen journey to become whole again, to get back up again. Right. Oh, that's beautiful. That's really beautiful. That's what made me think that that might, that tattoo might be the one that stays because I can't think of anything bigger than that for me. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I yeah. think that with uh, mental illness, with um, the the complexity of life now, with the, how fast life moves, with COVID, um, the challenges for people to um, 
deal and heal from hardship, emotional hardship and psychological hardship is not one that we should assume people are doing well. Yeah. You're a social worker, you know, exactly. I mean, I feel so strongly about that. Yes. Yeah. This last year. Um, and, you know, like I was saying, we took care of my mother-in-law in the midst of COVID this last summer and flying back and forth from LA to Michigan to take turns, my husband and I, um, and then trying to be the gatekeeper in terms of who was coming in to see her and what risk that was for us. And the complexity of how COVID has shaped serious illness right now, um, as well as the grief, because then it became, are we having a service and what does that look like? And, okay. and the normal things of having my friends from another area come to be with me and, you know, um, and, and we're in Los Angeles, which fortunately has gotten a little better in recent weeks, but has been really, really affected by yeah. COVID. And yeah. so working with families with trying to make some of these, again, it's that indecisive, it's not knowing what to do, yeah. you know, and we are now living in a, in a time where it's never been harder to know what the right thing to do is. Yeah, yeah. Maybe not never, but at least in my experience on earth, I, I've never been as uncertain of the right thing yeah. to do in so many situations. You know, do I yeah. send my kid back to school or not? Do I do this? Do I go to dinner or not? Do, and, and that's true with people who are experiencing serious illness right now and grief. So it's, yeah, there, it's a, it's really, it really is because like dealing with my dad who has end-stage heart disease and he's really in the final stages and he's happy. He's not suffering. He, he, he's got the benefit of two nurse daughters who are constantly optimizing him. So we're good there, but it's not just <laughs> making a decision to go into the hospital the next hot time he has to go. Cause with end-stage heart disease, that often happens. Now with COVID it's, do you want to go in there? We might not ever see you again. That completely compounds it. And we can't be selfish to say, you might go in to do this next procedure and I'm having feelings about never seeing you again. I want to have this beautiful death with you if you happen to die. I don't want you to be alone, but my dad's fine. He goes, I'm okay. Don't worry. I'm, you know, God's with me. I'm okay. I would like to give it a try. So he's not tortured by it. I would be. Right tortured right. by it. And I, I know many, I've heard too many people like you, like everybody, the stories where you can't be with your loved one. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we've, we've experienced an increase in people coming on the hospice um, in, at least in our area, because um, people want to be with their family member um, and, and are afraid of not being able to do so during during this time. So, so when somebody comes into the hospital with COVID and it looks like they're dying and they don't like most, so many people die immediately, like within 20, you know, right away, but say they do have time to go home. If they don't have a previous terminal diagnosis, are they allowed to go into hospice for COVID dying? Is that appropriate? Are they, or does it have to be somebody already had an end stage illness? They, um, that is a good question. We, my, the hospice company that I work for is affiliated with our home health program as well. So what most has happened is if they don't have an underlying terminal diagnosis other than COVID, um, then they've gone home on home health and gotten support through them. And then if they have an a what qualifies as a terminal diagnosis under Medicare prior program. to COVID prior, to, prior COVID. to COVID then they come on to hospice um and do you know the reasoning behind that why they're not allowing COVID as a diagnosis so that do you understand what that's about honestly to me I think it's just the red tape of Medicare expanding their diagnoses I'm, I'm not sure if that will now become I, I, it's tricky. It would be end stage COVID. It would be the diagnosis, right? Like end stage heart disease or end stage Alzheimer's. And because that window is so short of that diagnosis, I think it's just a little tricky. I just it's hard to get caught up yet. Mobilized. Yeah. But 
Um, fortunately, my experience, at least in my specific community um, and in working with home health and kind of knowing what they're going through, the majority of people, well, what I'll say is the majority of time, if someone is younger, yeah, they they just stay in the hospital. The family right. it just wants to keep trying, right? Um, so, and then if they're older, often there is some underlying diagnosis right. that we can attach, <laughs> right, uh, to bring them home on hospice. Yeah, and that makes total some, sense. Total some sense. families really, I mean, the patient has gotten home and and done better. Right. You know, and and now we're looking at. I, I don't know that they'll stay on hospice because they've actually improved so much. They've improved. They really think they're terminal. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what happens wonderful. with people with end-stage heart disease. Of often within people with end-stage heart disease, um, I have been part of discharging many people off of hospice mm-hmm. service because they get better with the proper treatment. And COVID, I could see it's just you didn't die. <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. They thought you're gonna die. You just didn't die, and so you get you have this miracle recovery, and there you go. But um, people with end stage heart disease, as you know, they'll be discharged um, often and have to come back later when when they when the next exacerbation comes up that takes them towards the end of their life. That's the craziness with end stage heart disease. It just does this roller coaster for years, so many people, and some people don't get the benefit of years. They do die, you know. Yeah, and so COPD. COPD is the same, chronic similar, obstructive yeah. uh, heart, lung issue, uh, COPD. And, and, and I would say dementia and Alzheimer's are also difficult diagnoses to yes. kind of know how long someone will survive. Yeah, it's like with end stage people with uh, dementia and the end stages, what makes that so hard is it's like um, the, what the pattern that happens with end stage cardiac. I'm doing this mostly for our listeners. I know you know this, <laughs> but um, is that people with end stage dementia can often have their exacerbations go like this too. And they can approach where they are near death. They are near death and they bounce back just like yeah, people yeah. with end stage heart disease. They are near, it's not just, oh, we thought they were, they were, <laughs> and they came back. Um, for whatever, you know, the disease process uh, allowed it. And so that happens with dementia too. So a lot of people with, uh, with family who have that, they go through the same roller coaster. And this year wasn't the last Christmas. It was, you know, five years ago, wasn't the last birthday. And that's very hard for people to, to live with. It's very hard. And it's very hard then to, to know when, when the real time is right. And, um, and and we'll get, I mean, I had that experience with my grandparents. They both, they both died within the last year and they both had so many hospital admissions. (laughs) So many, I mean, I can't tell you how many times my mom would call and be like, grandma's back in the hospital. Okay. You know, and, um, and you kind of habituate to, well, that's just what they do. That's what the, yeah. Yeah. And then it becomes a surprise when they die, even though, I know. <laughs> even though it's like, well, they were in the hospital eight times this year. Right. I, you know, you know that that's probably an indicator. Right. That the time is close. And yet they've been to the hospital eight times. I didn't think this would be the last. Right. It's, right. It's very, very complicated. <laughs> It is complicated. And I was just having a conversation with a colleague this morning about anticipatory grief. And that's exactly what we're dealing with when we have somebody that um, we're walking with uh, serious illness and or end stage of the illness is we're actually in that there's not a lot written about anticipatory grieving. And it is a little different than actual death grieving. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, that too. And so I think people would be wise to look into that, even though there's not much written about it, have the people in your world be your case study. Now look at when you're accompanying people through their journey through dying, um, if you're not the one losing them, like say you're the friend of someone losing them, know that that person is actually grieving in a way that's different Mm -hmm. and that um there are some things written in in in, you'll see a few articles but you know just the typical things you would expect right would you share with us some things people can look for uh, can 
pretty much know they're going to see in their a loved one that's caregiving someone who's dying? Yeah, I think, I mean, anticip anticipatory grief, um, you know, we have, we work a lot in that space within my role as a hospice social worker. Um, you know, we, we like, that's our whole role, really. All right. Of yeah. yeah. It's like, and a lot of it is, is, you know, also these, these situations like role reversal, where, you know, the daughter is now kind of the parent in terms of taking care of this person, um, taking care of her mom. And now she's telling mom, no, like this is, you can't drive anymore. Um, and, and so mom might be having her grief about losing her license and not being able to drive anymore. And the daughter is having her grief about mom can't drive. I'm now in this role of being kind of her parent. I, I can't look to mom necessarily to solve things for me. Um, you know, the relationship has shifted and so that can cause some grief. Um, watching someone lose weight with cancer and go through pain um, and become less, uh, you know, to be more withdrawn. I, I have a friend of mine um, who's on hospice right now and, you know, we text every day and now it's like, she doesn't text me until the afternoon because she's sleeping so much. Yeah. Um, and I can't visit her as often because she's conserving energy. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm already missing her. Yeah. She's still here. Yes. And that, and, and then I project how I'm going to be feeling. And then right. that takes me, I'm like, yeah. oh man, there's going to be a time when she can't return my text because she'll be gone. Yeah. And so each of those, I think anticipatory grief is, is good work though. I think it does help us because it helps give ourselves little moments of sitting with what it's gonna feel like later, um, allowing ourselves this grief mm -hmm. and um, nothing prepares us, nothing takes away grief after someone dies. Um, but, but I do feel like people who, who begin the process and who can talk through it and acknowledge it and journal and kind of be in that space. They, in my experience, they typically do fare a little better in their grief. Yeah, that's good. That's yeah. a good, uh, it, it makes me um, realize that uh, anticipatory grief, though there might not be a lot written about it, in actuality requires tremendous support um, I think, like you said, to have maybe a better outcome after it's all over, because the whole purpose of hospice, when you really think about it, it's, it's helping them cope through that as well as medical management of symptoms. Um, the social work, the chaplain, the CNA, even helping relieve the burden, the nurse, of course, being eyes and ears, they don't have to go run around to doctors, but we're helping lighten the load so they can grieve before along the way and get used to the loss that may become, you know, that is coming. Um, like there's so much to click into place around journeying with dying. Yes. And we're not taught that how to journey with dying and yeah. anticipatory grieving is all part of that. That's it. Yes. And I, you know, something that, I've been thinking about more recently has been this idea that, you know, because some I'm interrupting myself. Sometimes it seems to take so long for someone to die. Um, yeah. You know, I have cancer patients, especially if they're young, that it just gets to this excruciating point sometimes where the family is just like, you know, they've kind of been sitting at bedside for days yeah. Um, and, and it, and even before that point, um, I, I feel like the dying process when it, when it happens in this disease way, not sudden death, but I think part of that 
serves a purpose of helping us prepare to say goodbye yeah. because you just can't watch them in that state anymore. Right. So you begin to get ready yeah. because anything feels better than watching them struggle or in that state. And so, and you know, people typically withdraw when they're, um, you know, a few weeks before death, people, you know, they, they don't eat as much, they sleep more, all of these things that pull them away from people that they love, um, which is so difficult, but I think it, it all does help the grievers yeah. Um, begin to let go because of that process. Yeah. But man, it's heavy. Oh know? yeah. Oh, it's sad. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going through it with my dad. Um, he's happy. He's not suffering. He's, but he's withdrawing. He's sleeping more, all of that. And it's just like, you're going, Oh, like sometimes you're okay with it. And then many times, did you find yourself like you just stop and you look at them and you go, wow, you look different than you did last year. Yeah. You, you are different than you, you are losing your strength. And when your parents, your grandparents, you're used to seeing them one way. I mean, I know my grandmother was looked like my grandmother my whole life. <laughs> and then I realized when I came in the picture, she was only 40 or something. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I know my my idea about what is old has certainly shifted. Totally changed. Yeah, totally <laughs> yeah. changed. But totally. I, I I really agree with you. I think there's just I, I think there's just so many moments when if we pause and we we allow ourselves to really see what's in front of us, you know. Um, when I, again, talking about my friend um, who is on hospice, and if I go a couple of weeks without seeing her and I see her and I, I sometimes, I mean, I use my skills as a social worker to, and my mask that I have to wear yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to, to um, try to create kind of a blank canvas so she doesn't see the surprise on my face of how much yeah. weight she's lost you yeah. know, because I don't want to put that on her, but I am right. feeling that. And it's right. like, wow, it hasn't been that long of a time, but I, I am seeing. Yes. Now. Yes. Oh, you know, you're bringing up the, um, the ring theory in my mind, I'm writing all these things down. So that ring theory about um, people will often wonder, what do I do? What do I say? And something that can generally be helpful, I'm sure you know about it too, uh, y'all I'm going to put it in the links is that think of a concentric circles of a tree and the person who's dying is in the center and their primary caregivers that first ring then wherever you fall in that you like she said she wants to be blank canvas coming in mm -hmm. and then when she leaves she can call me <laughs> um, right. person on the outside of the ring like I'm on the outside of her ring Mm -hmm. so that she can dump out. So you support in, dump out. So just even thinking of it that way will help a lot with figuring out what to do or say. I, have, I know you've seen this. I'm with a family. They're having a great day. They're not all morose that day. Or I mean, this is devastating what's happening. And they're having a happy day and laughing. And then somebody walks in and just brings all of their grief. Oh and dumps it on their good day that they rarely get to have. That's an example of dumping in, which you don't wanna do. You wanna dump out and try to prepare yourself, cry, do whatever you need to do when you walk in to just match them where they are, yes. right? Yeah. Talk to us yeah. about that. Oh, I have, a, I have so many things to say about <laughs> that. Good. Thank you, thank you. So I totally agree with you. Match their energy. That that is the most important thing. You know, as a doula, as as a support person, as a friend, you you want to come in um, aware of where you're at, um, and and being an observer for a little bit 
before you make too much of an impression, you know, feel the energy in the room, look at people's faces, see where they're at, how are people greeting you? And then you, you go from there, you know, even as, as a hospice social worker, if, if the family is having a great day and, um, the patient is, is not experiencing pain today. And I'm, I am, I am going to hold off on some discussions, um, for a phone call later or for a different time, because, because I don't want to, I don't want to ruin that beautiful moment of reprieve that they have. Um, those are moments of reprieve. Yes. Yes. And, and one, one time that I, I, someone dumped that I just, I, I, I just became angry because it was a UPS driver. UPS driver comes in <laughs> to deliver a package to this, um, you know, this person's home. Um, they had a few steps, so, and it was heavy. So he carried it up and he knocks on the door and apparently he's been delivering to this family for a period of time. And he walks in and he sees this, um, our hospice patient who, who is probably a week or two from death and just gets teary eyed and says, Oh gosh, Bob, I didn't know you were doing so bad. Oh, wow. Mm. Oh, you look horrible. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> yeah. and the room is just, you know, the wife who's trying to take care of him and the patient. And they're just looking at this man who just said everything that was going through his head. And, no one knows how to respond. And so, you know, I kind of jump in and thank you for bringing the package, <laughs> you know, yeah, just kind of push them out the door. And we ended up talking about it. And, and she was like, yeah, I don't even like she, the wife was telling me how many people she limits to coming because when they see him, they have so much outward expression of grief, many people in her circle that, that then she has to take care of them. And she doesn't have the capacity to take care of them in their grief at that moment. Yeah. So don't be the (laughs) driver. Yes, (laughs) yes, yes, that is so, thank you for those those, uh, situations that you share. You know, I feel bad for people. They, like you said, they truly can't process what's happening or their first reaction is they're so startled. They don't know what, they're just naturally in their grief. It's almost like a mini little crisis for them. Uh, they can't control it. So I like the idea of um, having people kind of like have a, how to respond, a first responder <laughs> or first response yeah. to coming into some kind of crisis, have some kind of thing where you say, okay, assess the room, like read the room. This is how you read the room. Yeah. Spend about this many minutes, um, you know, et cetera. Um, the, the ring theory, like that could be a little ER kit right there. A little, a little. Definitely. I love that idea. Right. I love that idea. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I didn't realize as much about the energy until I was sick a few years ago and I had, um, I had to have a couple surgeries and I, it took a few months to recover and, um, and I just felt so bad all the time. And, um, and I had a friend come visit and she came in with all this energy and she was like, Oh, you know, really loud. <laughs> and it made me feel worse. Like my nausea increased, my pain yeah. increased. And I'm just like, what are you doing with that noise? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Slow down, you yeah. know? And through that experience, I realized, because sometimes I'll do joint visits with a nurse and we might be, you know, we're going about our day. We come in, we might be chatting on the walk up yeah, and we might come in with this energy of like, we just had, we just laughed about something. Right, right, right. And, and now I, I pause. (laughs) Yeah. Let's take a minute. Um, and then we, we enter more of a, you know, as close to kind of a neutral state. Yes. Until you see yes. what's going on. I like that. I'm going to write down neutral state. Um, I love that. You're right, because you do feel it. Being on the doula side of caring for families and watching hospice come in and go, I have been rudely awakened to 
just so much that I'm so embarrassed to say that I did um, over the years. Yeah. Because I didn't know any better or like mm -hmm. things that you thought was bringing um, comfort in that you really mattered to me was actually might be causing anxiety. So mm -hmm. I love that. Um, I love that our awareness is like the doula role, for instance, because I have ex so much experience on the hospice side, I can share from the doula side what would be most helpful um, for families and supporters of families that that even hospice personnel can't share as as accurately as I can and other people that have like say if you started serving people outside of hospice you would see the same thing that people hospice has to take control of things so so they do have an agenda and they have to Mm -hmm. um, the doula doesn't have to have that. So what happens because hospice has that agenda, there is a pressure to the visit that there's a time limitation because it's with an agency and we have to get this thing done. Yeah. So you can't get around that and you want that because that's what's helping have the death process smoothly. And it's still more time than most people can ever have with anybody other, any other health professional. They rarely get an hour with anybody medical, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's beautiful. Um, as a doula, though, you see the pressured entrance and exit, even though you try to not be pressured, they feel led, even though they're trying to be non-intrusive. Hospice is trying to let them leave, but there is an agenda and you feel it. So, and often when people leave, I never was told this for rarely, but they go, did you see how they just assumed we wanted, did you see? I'm like, oh my goodness, I didn't see it before they said it because I wasn't conscious of it. And now I see it all the time. Yeah. So those are, those are very good observations. Yeah. And I just I, don't know how you fix it though, because you only have an hour. I know. I, I think, I, I, I think the more we just are mindful of it, the more we can, you know, be thoughtful about our interactions. Um, you know, I, our team does a lot of joint visits and I really believe in that because I'm often supporting family while the nurse is taking vitals and I can help her kind of move along on her day <laughs> and I have more time as the hospice social worker than the nurses do because I have oh yeah, yeah yeah and so yeah. um so I think that's one way is to kind of partner up and 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 it, if it feels like the nurse is a little rushed because they have to leave, then the social worker or chaplain stays behind and allows for more of a feeling of we have time. We have time yeah. to discuss Yeah, things. that's good. That's really um, good. But you know, when my, when my mother-in-law was in hospice last year, it was another opportunity for me to really learn what it was like being on the side of the family. And Oh, I sure learned some lessons from that too. You know, just changing the time of your visit. Yes. Scheduling. Oh my gosh. I, I never knew how much turmoil that causes. Yes. You schedule your visit. Um, Cause we're, you know, typically if you're working in hospice as a provider, you're healthy and your day is your day. And that's all that you're thinking about. In, in the patient and family's world, it is what time is, you know, what to be ready to greet the nurse. And many people don't want to be in their pajamas or right. not having brushed their teeth or, sure. you know, they want time to, yeah. and, and to prepare. And maybe they're scheduling a friend coming over after the visit. And so if you bump your visit, then when is the friend coming? Um, yeah. so there's, there is a lot of just, I, I mean, really, I think most times that we change how we do things is when we have a personal experience ourselves that gives us, yes, insight. <laughs> that gives us insight. And then also, you know, in hospice, because, and I understand it's even more people that people are caring for than there used to be. I haven't um, worked hospice in five years, but I know that our caseloads were pretty large then. And I hear that it's maybe a little bit more now. 
And um, with COVID, I'm not exactly sure how it's changed because I know the nurses have to see everybody. And I, from what I understand, the hospice social workers and chaplains, they are doing by phone, right? Zoom and phone for the- for we're, large... we're in the home. You're in the home now? Okay, We've that's- been in the home for the last six months or so. Oh, good. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, it was just the first few months, at least our agency, where we initially weren't going out and, and the families didn't want us out. And now, for the most part, people- are accepting our visits and let us. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. But I know different hospices are, are operating. Well, they are. Yeah. Uh, but I'm glad to hear that y'all stayed open for that long. Yeah. We just don't know. We don't, we didn't know about COVID and we still really don't with the strain variation, but I think we're doing the, I think that I, I like the way um, some things are moving along, but I know that you're being careful and honoring everything we do know in hospice, especially because you're medical. So I just love, um, I just, this death deck, going back to the death deck, just how much <laughs> conversation, a couple of questions, <laughs> a couple of questions got us going and rolling and we could be here all day. And that's just a couple questions. Yeah. That so, was one of the biggest surprises that Lori and I found when we started playing with people, we would bring out a stack like this. Deanna, and we would just be okay we're gonna get through these questions and then it'd be two hours later and we go through maybe five and we're yeah like, I can totally <laughs> see that so how do people get it you can get it on our website which is the death deck .com. okay good okay and we also sell on Amazon if you prefer okay well I got my little deck here and I believe believe me I'm going to be playing with it, especially with my family, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I play with my family, um, including my 12 year old. And, um, and, and that's actually really fun. Um, teenagers and young adults, college kids who, who feel like death is so far from them, yeah, so far. you know, they can really get into these questions because, um, it, it's all philosophical and they're totally world, you know? yeah yeah <laughs> and, and this is a lot them. more fun to play when it's not going on in your life obviously it is i probably wouldn't be playing this uh, uh, if if we're dealing with dying in my house i don't see it at all no. no i do use some of the some of the questions are really based on my experience in the space so i will ask the questions of some of my family yeah. kind of yeah. gather information um and some of my families have a great sense of humor and and yeah it would totally be appropriate to to actually use the deck in the homes but i love that i would say most of the most of the time i'm i'm using the um questions to help me be thoughtful about conversations with my hospice patients, but I'm not bringing the deck out. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is for the rest of us that need a little. That's help. for the rest of us. <laughs> this yeah. is the rest of us. Uh, thank you so much for doing this, for coming to talk to me. Oh, We're definitely going to have round twos with you um, if, if you'll come back. I would love it. I would love yeah. it. We could talk all day. I know. <laughs> and we will. We'll yeah. just respond. <laughs> That's the way we want everybody to be about this. Like, I know that y'all aren't, you know, like us in that it, it's consuming to us because we have a mission. You know, you have a mission. I have a mission that really inspires me. Um, and, and so those of you who don't have that mission, but you're interested and want to be part of um, making sure your own family is empowered. Um, these kind of convers you're going to be more comfortable having these conversations, right? They're going to be more comfortable with their own families. You're going to be that one in your family that people go, oh yeah, she likes to talk about that stuff. <laughs> exactly. You want, you want to be the one where they say, oh, we, we're always talking about this when you're around. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a compliment. Yeah. It's a compliment yeah, and you're helping. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. good. You're that empowering means, your family. Yeah. That means you're comfortable enough to, to, um, have these conversations and encourage them. And, and I really, my, my final note is that, you know, I've, I've played this game in, in bars, in breweries, in restaurants, in um, party settings, and people think they don't want to talk about death, but they do. 
They, they do. really do. They Thank everyone you. has opinions and beliefs yes. and values and thoughts and stories and um and do you have really some afterlife stuff in here? You said you have some kind of the like medium kind of stuff or spiritual. We do. We have questions oh, cool. about mediums, cool. um, how you might visit your family after you die, how they'll yeah. know if you, whether you believe in signs, um, if you believe in reincarnation, what do you think the afterlife is? Um, so we have a whole slew of cards in that vein um, that can enrich some conversations with your family and friends yay but okay yay. well thank so you see you soon yes okay. i look you. forward to next time me 